Thank you, uh, Aishwarya. Uh, it, indeed, uh, I mean, it's a privilege to uh, host some of the stalwarts of the uh, industry. And uh, like Aishwarya said, uh, the rise of India is synonymous with the rise of alternate investment space. So just to uh, bring out some facts back into uh, 2017, AIF plus PMS uh, put together uh, was a three, three and a half lakh crore uh, industry. And uh, as we speak over the last five years, uh, the size of the industry has uh, galloped to close to 10 lakh crores. Uh, the rise uh, indeed has been meteoric. Uh, there have been certain reasons why uh, why uh, the rise has been so meteoric and it's expected to grow uh, much faster than most other investment avenues. So uh, I will uh, you know, draw upon the expertise and experience of uh, uh, my panelists to uh, try and make sense of uh, what's working and what will work for investors from here on. So uh, let me start with uh, with Ananya. Uh, Ananya, uh, you know, uh, uh, the AIF landscape, right? Uh, there's a lot of traction, a lot uh, happening on CAT 2, a lot of, uh, happening on CAT 3. Uh, lay it out for us. Let us know what's working uh, at the moment. What are uh, investors uh, investing in? Uh, thank you, Shreyas. Uh, good evening, everyone. I think, uh, you know, let's uh, draw some inferences from the global factor because that's where you know, we all know that whatever is happening in India, probably we are we are kind of shadowing it maybe by five to seven odd years. So if I look back globally, the good things is the alternate assets globally constitute almost 21% of the global asset, which is close to $100 trillion. And the revenue part is almost like a 50%. So the good part is that alternate assets are catching a lot of attention globally. Uh, within the space, if we further look at it, the private debt and a private equity these are the two factors within the alternate, which is really getting a lot of attention. And, and almost that space is growing between 15 to 20% annually, uh, despite the fact that the, this space is expected to grow. And as per the BCG report, which recently got published, this space is expected to grow between 7 to 8%. But uh, the private equity and the private debt is the one which is going to be the leading factor. You know, what again thing is getting noticed is a lot of shift a lot of shift has started getting noticed from an institutional perspective to retail. Uh, retail is the one which is really driving the, uh, you know, the space globally. Uh, again, that space is expected to grow between 15 to 20 odd percent, the retail alone, and it is growing much faster than what institution is doing. Uh, the reasons are very simple that uh, innovations and ideations is what something that retail likes, that retail like the, uh, you know, the returns, expectations. But one thing, Shreyas, which again started getting noticed and is very, very alarming and very rather, I, I would say, uh, really surprising to see the acceptance, the acceptance ratio, what used to be for the innovation or new ideas, that ratio used to be close to 60 odd percentage. If I go back in 2010, has actually dropped down to almost 35 today. So what is happening is people are very happy looking at the traditional approaches. People are very happy to see, uh, you know, what all is going on well, and rather than looking into uh, stuff which is very, very innovative. And that's where another very uh, startling, uh, you know, uh, perspective which came in. Uh, if I go further, I've expected is that the private equity and a debt is going to be generating more than 60% of the total revenue of the alternate assets over next maybe four to five years. So that is what the global looks like. Let's come back to India uh, because that's something what matters to all of us. India, the scenarios aren't very different. If I look at the growth in last three to five odd years, uh, your CAT 2 has grown by almost 2.4x vis a vis a CAT 1 or CAT 3, which has grown by 1.6. And what is driving again a CAT 2 in India is exactly the mirror image of what we are noticing globally is a private equity and a private debt space. So, not too much of a difference is getting noticed. I think the good part is. If we are talking about at a at a scale of almost uh, 100 and 100 trillion dollars, we are talking about some seven odd percent being annualized growth in the in the alternate space. One can understand with a base that we are having, which is what close to three point uh, three point three three point four trillion uh, you know lakh dollars uh, lakh crores of money in between CAT two and a CAT three. We actually haven't scratched the surface. There is a massive there is a way 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 uh, ahead that we all can go ahead on this. Uh, you are on a mute, Shreyas. Yeah, indeed. Uh, local trends, global trends, all uh, pointing towards uh, 
the need of uh, individuals to uh, get more bang for the buck. Uh, let me draw uh, upon Nimesh's expertise here. Uh, Nimesh, you've been, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, driving the PMS uh, business for your uh, company as well as in general uh, created uh, space for PMS uh, as a product. Uh, so uh, no one better can answer this. Uh, you know, tell us what's happening uh, with respect to PMS. What are investors doing? What are asset managers thinking? Uh, thanks, Shreyas, and good evening, everyone. Um, so, uh, Shreyas, let me share. Last month, I was making a presentation to a group of investors uh, so I can share the PMS uh, uh, industry landscape data for the con everyone's consumption. As of May 2023, the size of discretionary PMS, which is non-EPFO and PFAUM, stands at 2.7 like, lakh crore with 1.2 lakh clients, which means that discretionary PMS over the last decade has grown at about 23% CAGR uh, uh, as on May 23. Uh, for the same time, our uh, ASK equity AUM has grown from 700 crores in May 13 to about 26,000 crores, about a 39 times growth at a CAGR of 44% in the last 10 years. I believe every industry goes through a phase of consolidation. And uh, uh, in the last one, two years, it has been a consolidation phase for the PMS industry as a whole. Now, I think uh, SEBI brought parity uh, to brokerage uh, in all product platforms. So I believe PMS once again should get back to the same traction which it was uh, uh, in, in the past. Now, you asked me about the questions about what's working, what's trending in the PMS industry. It's tough for me to really comment about uh, exactly. But maybe I'll uh, share uh, what has worked for us. Uh, and uh, so therefore, I would like to share, we at ASK, I uh, uh, believe uh, we are not agnostic to any market cap uh, kind of products because we believe uh, it's not the size of the fish, but the size of the pond or the opportunity which really matters. In other words, the debate between the large cap, the mid cap and a small cap is all an artificial one. The real debate should be between quality or lack of quality, the quality of business, the quality of management, the quality of earnings, uh, the quality of uh, cash flows and quality of balance sheet. And you talked about traction. So I can say uh, what I can borrow from Anunya said, uh, the traction continues to be in traditional products for us also in an idea we conceptualized almost 14 years back. And let's briefly touch upon, because I'm told that there are about 1,000 plus investors today on the call. Uh, so let me just briefly touch upon. We did this study uh, internally in 2009. We studied the top 500 companies of the country, and we found that there are four ownership patterns. Uh, first, led by the entrepreneur or promoters of the country. Uh, second, public sector enterprise run by government. Third, multinationals, we all understand, and professional uh, run companies. All these companies were tested on four parameters. How is the top line of the company growing? How is the bottom line of the company growing? the EBITDA, the profit before tax, profit after tax, the capital efficiency, ROC and ROE of the company. And lastly, uh, net uh, investment returns in the hand of investor, net of capital dilution. And to our surprise, uh, for almost all the parameters and uh, uh, and for almost all the times of the 10 years, IP entrepreneur as a uh, promoter holding came out to be uh, uh, very ahead of all the other form of ownership. And that, uh, you know, uh, made us deep dive into understanding as to what brings in uh, uh, the success into an entrepreneur. And what we found was very interesting. Uh, and for the benefit of investors, I'll share the promoter, the entrepreneur brings in his own skin in the game. He owns 25, 30, 40, 50, 70 percent of his company. And therefore, uh, the intellectual capital, the drive, the passion, the commitment, uh, which he brings into business cannot be formed uh, or matched by any other form of ownership. So right. uh, that traditional idea or concept we started in uh, 2000, March 2001. Today, as we speak, IP is not only the single largest strategy in the country with more than 20,000 crores of asset, it is also one of the most consistent and risk-adjusted portfolio in the country. Right. Just one uh, last data point, since inception in the last 10-year rolling returns, 93% of the time, IP has uh, delivered more than 15% CAGR versus the benchmark of 2%. So I'm just drawing back to what Anunya said. People are coming back, investors are coming back to what traditionally what has worked for in a long period of time and therefore investing rather than trying to identify uh, newer ideas and themes as far as PM is concerned. Right. Thank, uh, thanks, Tamesh. Uh, so, uh, Sandeep, moving to you, uh, you know, uh, you side over. 
one of the largest uh, mutual funds in the uh, in the country and uh, i understand uh, uh, you guys are doing some work on gift city and you know gift city was uh, the prime minister's dream uh, it is our uh, our way of accessing the world and letting the world access uh, uh, indian opportunities so uh, tell us uh, what's happening there what are the products uh, uh, you would originate out of uh, uh, you know places like gift city uh, sure thanks shreyas and good evening everyone uh, so you know when it comes to gift city you know one thing that we all know is that gift city is on the lines of international financial centers like london dubai singapore etc so you know prime minister has this vision of creating uh, you know this kind of a world class infrastructure uh, you know over uh, in the gift city also you know the regulatory environment over there is very friendly and uh, there are of course tax incentives which are available so that's making gift city to be a very attractive proposition uh, for for people who probably want to invest outside india and of course there are many many more who wants to invest into india now you know so what we are doing in gift city is we are basically trying to cover both these areas uh we are working out two products one is an outbound uh, you know aif which will be investing in uh, you know various funds of our uh, you know joint venture partner amundi you know they have a host of products and these pro these products are very unique products which are not available in, uh, to investors in india so what we are trying to do is we are trying to create a vehicle in which indians who want to uh, you know diversify globally uh, in terms of uh, their investments they can make use of this route also there is a tremendous interest that we are finding uh, for for investors who have as of now not invested in india and i'm talking about basically you know fpis uh, and also you know there would be a lot of nris who would like to take more exposure to india in a more uh, clearer manner so that they they do not have to uh, face the hassle of taxation and all that's where you know we are working out a product which is uh, you know what we are going to do is we are we are launching a hedge fund basically a long shot fund uh, which has a distinct advantage because when you when you launch such a fund in india there is a huge tax uh, implication on the arbitrage portion which is not there uh, you know in in the gift city and so we are working on this so basically you know in addition to us there are so many other asset managers uh, you know who are really working uh, to to launch newer products so what what i what we really believe is that uh, gift city is going to become a very very huge platform wherein uh, you know people who want to either invest into india or want to take exposure to outside world uh, it will it will become a very helpful vehicle for uh, for the investors fantastic fantastic so there you have it i think largely speaking this private debt this private equity within the listed space uh, you know more traditional approach steady state approach and within gift city uh, you know investing uh, outward so largely speaking the pms ai landscape revolves uh, uh, around these opportunities so let's go uh, a little uh, deeper uh, and uh, back to ananya uh, ananya any uh, global products now uh, we know that generally from a investment trend perspective uh, uh, you know uh, products which are launched uh, in the west get launched after 7 8 years in india i mean the market size grows enough uh, to uh, have such uh, uh, a products launched what are the next uh, you know uh, from a product launch perspective what kind of products would come to india which are absent today great i think uh, you know some part of it uh, already got covered by sandeep uh, you know to me if i have to categorize these the opportunities i probably would categorize in three buckets one would be the hedge one would be the asset classes and third would be secondaries or a distressed assets hmm. uh, let me go one by one so in a hedge i think some bit of it we have done it in india i'm talking about a long shot kind of a fund we already have four equity seven non equity long shots and all but because of tax taxation uh, you know disadvantages we aren't seeing too much of attraction for that but globally if i look at it i think long shot is a big category for one to look at you know the black rock manages close to a billion dollar uh, pimco managed close to 800 million dollars so there is a lot of traction in the long shot which we are yet to see it happening in india and we are we ourselves have a long shot fund but we have kept it domiciled out of singapore other hedge strategy which i see a lot of uh, you know affinity globally is the market neutral approaches you know where there is a lot of uh, sense for a market neutral kind of a fund uh, where you would want to keep beta to zero you would not want to keep any kind of uh, incremental exposures and you would want to keep it half on a long and half on a short in a related 
uh, stocks and related ideas. So that is something which to me seems like, you know, once this stocks arbitrage or the gift city approach, as Sandeep was mentioning, when this catches attention, I'm pretty sure that uh, hedge would be a big category that will evolve eventually. Let's go back to the different asset classes. I think, uh, you know, two asset classes which has really seen a lot of interest besides gold and commodity that we have all been talking about is wine and an art, which we have been noticing. And the, and the beauty is the market is really grappling uh, in attention of a lot of investors. You have, you have to simply put a number, global wine market is close to $333 billion and is growing almost like a 5% per annum. So that is the kind of opportunity which is there. India, you know, which is very surprising. We probably we haven't noticed it, but we are growing annually almost 30, 32% in India, the wine market. And this market, what used to be less than $70 million by 2017 is likely to be adding, and I'm using the word adding $700 million over next three to five odd years. So this is the kind of opportunity which is building it up. I think that's a, that's an asset class which should uh, seek attention. Art is certainly the one which has seen a lot of attention in globally. Well, we, yeah, we have the misses uh, on the art side, but recently what we have noticed in 2022, you know, one of the Bessel Miami Beach, uh, you know, auction which happened in New York, uh, the, the prices have almost got to $3.2 billion. So there is an attention which is getting caught up over there. But unfortunately, uh, this is one asset class which is, which is obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, gets gets affected with a lot of global uh, headwinds, like and and this uh, uh, cross border escalation that one can see happening in the Ukraine probably going to impact. So I don't, I'm not so much uh, keen on this. But where I can see the third bucket, which is where I can see a lot of interest eventually will get built up in India, would be the secondaries and the distress assets. Now, secondaries is a, is a very classic market. It is almost like a 15 to $18 billion if I go back and it is growing at a rapid pace. Now, this talks about in a, in a category two private equity space, if we have an asset and my fund is maturing and I do not, I'm not able to make an exit, there is always a way to make an exit through a secondaries. And that is the way the markets are building it up, wherein you being an acquirer can actually get a good premium on a discounted side. Uh, can actually walk in your can actually get the deal shift in your favor, wherein you can get a great discounted pricing. And the secondaries to me, or a distress asset to me, is the third asset class which should take attention in India. Not to say uh, the very fact that the tax the tax arbitrage, uh, you know, which has gone away from an equity mutual from a, from a mutual fund side uh, on a taxation piece, is certainly going to again echo the same voice of a private debt which I just spoke sometime back on the global side. Right. Interesting. Uh, sounds like a lot of opportunities for asset managers. And, uh, uh, you know, one, one more round of education uh, uh, we all have to carry out for our investors, for them to appreciate the size of the opportunity. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. So, uh, Nimish, uh, moving to you, uh, traditionally, uh, we know that 40 lakh crore uh, uh, worth investments have been made through mutual funds. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, a mutual fund is picked to be a fairly retail uh, uh, oriented product. Uh, in your view, why, uh, why is, especially over the last two years, why has so much attention shifted to PMS AIF? Sure. Uh, it's a very important uh, and good uh, question. As far as MFs are concerned, a good set of investors prefer alternates, uh, according to me, for following reason. First, in case of mutual funds, there's a lot of standardization due to regulation. For example, there is a, a defined investment universe uh, guided by the underlying benchmark. So, in a mutual fund, we'll have to marry or mimic the benchmark uh, as closely as there. Second, I think the individual stock and sector exposure limits are defined uh, in the mutual fund. Third, I think uh, uh, there is no uh, there is standardized expense structure for all set of investors irrespective of size. There is, uh, people say there is no alignment of interest because there is no performance-based pricing and maybe that will come. Now, this is all good. Uh, I would say, Mitchell, nothing wrong about it there because the set of investors we have there, the scale of investors, the 40 lakh uh, crore of money we manage there. But why is it that, uh, you know, clients prefer the PMS or, or mutual fund? I can share a few of them. First, uh, it is a far more open architecture in investing than a mutual fund. Uh, PMS uh, manager can onboard UHNI customers or family office at customers at a differential pricing, which is what you know higher uh, uh, you go. The expectation of the investors are there. 
Then there's a flexibility given to the portfolio manager to be overweight or underweight on stocks and sectors. And most importantly, the investment is not guided by the market cap or the underlying benchmark. Uh, and most importantly, a style of investing can be followed in a PMS uh, structure or a platform which allows investors to set or plan their long-term goals. Lastly, on the PMS side, there's far deeper and better enge engagement between UHNI clients and a portfolio manager. That's right. as PMS is concerned. Coming to AIFs, I think AIFs are the best of both mutual fund and PMS world solution. And this is very important uh, because uh, it's grown stupendously. Now, I think four or five things that come to my mind, why it is the best of both worlds. First, pricing in uh, AIF is standard like a mutual fund, but AIF also allows pricing flexibility like PMS, depending on the ticket size or the share class of the investment that comes in. Second, I think AIFs bring in the operational ease of the mutual funds, uh, but also has the ability to manage flows and segregate smaller pools of clients like in a PMS. Third, like in PMS, fund manager actions only in response to portfolio considerations as against the inflow outflow consideration in mutual fund, which is, you know, uh, predominantly there because of inflow and outflow. Fourth, stock and sector limit applies in uh, AIF also at the time of investing like in mutual fund, but AIF manager can continue to hold positions and be concentrated and run it more like a PMS. To sum up, I think uh, uh, given the advantages of this, I think small and mid-cap strategies, thematic ideas, niche ideas. I think if I can borrow from what Ananya talked about in other Cat1, Cat2, which we don't, are best suited uh, to be executed on AIF platforms and not open ended PMS platforms or also not suited on retail investor uh, platforms like mutual fund. I think those ideas which Ananya spoke and what uh, uh, one would like to do, the AIFs provide the best of all solutions. And therefore, I would believe that there is more and more attention of the UHNI towards the ultimates. Interesting. So optically, uh, you know, uh, you may own the same stock through different vehicles, but the objectives are very, very different. I think that's sure. ultimately uh, what uh, you are effectively trying to say. So Sandeep, moving on to you, quickly you run, uh, uh, you know, long shot strategies uh, on your alternate, uh, uh, you know, uh, alternate platform, right? Uh, uh, what are investors thinking? What kind of investors uh, uh, are you getting? And where does it fit in our client's asset allocation basket? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, uh, long shot strategies are not there for everyone. Uh, you know, there is a separate tree of investors who probably would like to take exposure to such strategies. If you really look at the overall pie, I think hardly three to five percent of alternate uh, investments which are done are done towards uh, uh, you know long short strategies and primarily the reason is that uh, uh, taxation is uh, very very killing for the product. But still, uh, you know there is a category of investors, those people who have made their money, uh, and and they don't want to earn six or seven percent interest. They know that wealth can be created and sustainably on a sustainable basis by taking exposure to equities, but they are very concerned with the kind of volatility which comes uh, with equity investments. And that's where, you know, those category of investors who want more than debt, uh, you know, but with less, uh, uh, you know, volatility of equity, these are the kind of investors that we seek in our long short funds. Also, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, taking a cue out of uh, uh, what Nimesh mentioned, uh, you know, on the mutual fund side, what is happening is that uh, the flows are so substantial that the size of the funds are increasing tremendously. Yes. Now, as an as a investment team, we have one of the largest investment team in the industry, a very capable team. We have a good track record. Now, we, on a normal basis, continue to identify stocks which are good, uh, which, which probably have a very good future, but they are very small in size. Now, we cannot play that those stocks, uh, you know, on the mutual fund side. So what we have done is this vehicle that we have created, the long short fund. Here we are going 65 to 70 percent exposed to equity at all times. And we try to play out those, uh, you know, ideas which we cannot play on the mutual fund platform, wherein the size, uh, you know, really dilutes. Uh, the impact that it can have on the uh, on the fund. So therefore, you know, long short funds, uh, we have also also tried to mitigate the, uh, you know, taxation impact because 70% of our portfolio 
always remain invested. So there is no tax that we have to pay. And even if even when we churn, uh, you know, it is only after three to five years with that kind of a mindset, we take stocks. So therefore, the overall taxation of the uh, product is in some kind of a control. So definitely there are investors who are looking at such strategies, uh, but they are not kind of uh, funds which are there for everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sandeep. So I, I just to add, uh, I think the investor type uh, which comes into the long shot strategy are uh, are mostly consistency seeking. At the same time, uh, appreciate the yields uh, in the uh, uh, in the country are low, and uh, by investing in an equity like product uh, using uh, the long shot funds, uh, typically try and get uh, something more out of uh, their. They don't want full ride of equity; they want some protection, and that's where long shot come into picture. So, Ananya, rolling back to you, uh, you know, is there scope of creating uh, hybrids on AIF? Let's say. Do partly debt, part uh, sorry, partly uh, unlisted uh, plus listed. Uh, is there scope? Is there a market? Uh, are the investors seeking a strategy like this? Oh well, yeah, in fact, uh, uh, just to put put into perspective, we are actually very smartly, uh, you know, applying this strategy. Uh, well, we know the very fact that we are the largest in a category two space. You know, in the unlisted private equity, we manage close to twenty five thousand crores of assets. But smartly, what we have also done, we have taken these stocks in a in a pre IPO stage knowing the very fact that they're going to get listed soon enough. And once they get listed, they stay in the portfolio because that's where we get a lot of advantages on the liquidity piece. It can be done the other way as well. You know, in a category three fund, when you open a fund and you can keep around 20 odd percent uh, kind of a leeway to keep the pre-IPO kind of a strategy because that's where you can get a lot of kicker. Again, something we have done it very smartly in our one of the category three fund, which is our equity opportunity fund where up to 20% of the money you can practically invest uh, into a cat into an unlisted, though it's a category three fund. Simultaneously, you know, in a you know, on a on a non-equity side, again, you can add a lot of kickers. You know, for example, you can do a very smartly uh, some bit of a tweaking at the in the asset classes, for example, you know, like uh, you maintain a triple A or a double A minus or double A plus kind of asset, which helps you create a generate liquidity. But likewise, you can also have something on an inward side in the in the portfolio, which helps you get a kicker. And that maybe you can have a 15, 20%, which can get you the kicker. Upper 70, 20% can get you liquidity. And again, you can create a fund wherein you can put create a one month, once in a month window uh, opportunity for a liquidity for a client and may be able to generate maybe 100, 150, 200 bips, a little bit more than what an what an uh, what a traditional liquid fund would generate for you. So, you know, the good part is uh, uh, alternate assets provide you a lot of uh, opportunity to create these kind of permutation combination, wherein, uh, you know, being in the space, you can still try and get a kicker, taking advantages of what an other asset class or other category of the alternate can bring into you. So while we have done it uh, very successfully in our equity space, both on the listed and unlisted, we are working on something on the private, on the non-equity as well, and we will be very soon coming out with that. So yes, uh, what you are saying, Shreyas, is uh, true to uh, label. There is a multiple ways that you can do these permutation combinations to build a, a better experience for a client. No, and I think we are we are seeing a lot of interest uh, in this category uh, too. Uh, you know, 60, 70 listed uh, do 20, 30 unlisted advantages are significant. You don't have to necessarily run a 10-year-old fund plus two. Uh, you and there are several uh, other advantages uh, of uh, running a strategy like this. So quickly, uh, I think we are uh, close to possibly taking the last question unless there is a Q and uh, a lineup. So uh, uh, Nimesh, uh, like uh, we we uh, follow QGLP philosophy with uh, risk management. Uh, why should a uh, customer come to you buy ASK products? With thirty seconds, uh, all of you, I'll go around the table. <laughs> sure, uh, uh, I would say the most trusted the oldest, the longest track record, and the most consistent risk-adjusted portfolio management house in the country. Uh, just to share data points to validate this statement, one crore invested in ASK growth portfolio in 2001 is now 47 crores versus 24 crores for the benchmark. A CAGR of 19% versus 15% for the last 22 long years suggests that ASK has been able to generate 4% alpha after fees for the long 22 long years and therefore, the most trusted and the longest track record company, one should invest wow. in. Fantastic. Uh, Sandeep, uh, why should someone uh, come to SBI for uh, investing their hard-earned money? 
So basically, you know, we are the largest uh, fund house, a subsidiary of uh, the largest bank, the most trusted uh, brand name. I think uh, uh, what we have created on the mutual fund side, we manage almost 20 lakh crores today, 8.2 lakh crores in mutual fund assets and around 12 lakh crores in institutional PMS. We have one of the uh, you know rock star team, or more than 70 member investment team, which has uh, stayed with us for a very, very long period of time. And uh, we, what we have created within SBI Mutual Fund is, uh, you know, a team which is more of a process-oriented team rather than, you know, having star managers in our team. So I think uh, we are very seriously venturing into alternates. Uh, the, we are taking baby steps, but we are very confident, you know, because whenever SBI enters into any, any new business, the target is that within three years, we have to become top three. And within five years, we have to be at the top. With that mindset, we are coming in. And in whichever market we go in, with whichever product, what we have seen is we have tried to increase the size of the market. And I think that is what is going to happen when SPI comes, uh, you know, with alternatives. So a lot, you will hear a lot from us um, in near future. And uh, we need the blessing of the industry to really grow. Thank you. That's great. Great, Sandeep. Uh, Ananya, same question for you. Yeah, I think I will put it in four letters, two I's and two S's. Ideate, innovate are the two I's. Citing and sizing are the two S's. I think the business that we are in, the innovation is something which is paramount. I think the way we have come up with the, in the in the alternate space, the pre-IPO space, which is where uh, you know we have too many offering, but uh, those innovations we were to we were the one who are able to bring in. I think citing and sizing is very very critical in this space because your ability to cite an asset at the right time and be able to mobilize money quick enough to take the position in those assets is a very, very critical function in this business again. So that is something that we have been, we have demonstrated it very well. Not, uh, not to say that we are the largest alternate asset player in the country. Almost 55,000 crores is what we manage. Private equity, we are the largest uh, in the, and, 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 and uh, you know, and, and that's where uh, we take uh, uh, a lot of uh, pride in. As Sandeep mentioned, I think, uh, it's the process and a framework which uh, constitutes our investment thesis as well. And that is the reason we have been able to be very consistent on our performance as well. Super, super. So uh, with, with Motilal Oswal, right, it's House of Ideas does equity all along. QGLP process along with risk management, these are the reasons why uh, a customer should come in uh, and consider Motilal Oswal products. So great, gentlemen. I think collectively, uh, all of us put together have uh, like 80, 85 years uh, worth experience. I think, uh, I hope we've been uh, able to add value to the audience. Uh, I hope, uh, you know, investors uh, and uh, distributors alike who are on call, uh, uh, have uh, learned a little bit. You can, of course, reach out to any one of us through uh, AIF PMS World uh, uh, if you have any uh, questions. Aishwarya, back to you. 